So this week we are lucky to have um, Jonathan with us. We did give you some reading on um, HEGRM uh, for you to um, prepare some questions for Jonathan. So we'd like to wel welcome Jonathan. Um, he is going to be, as you know, our guest speaker. So I'm going to just give a quick overview of his background because I, when, when um, I realised I actually didn't know a lot about Jonathan <laughs> and his background or previous to working at WHO, so um, Frank has helped me out with that. So you can correct me if I'm wrong, Jonathan, um, but you've spent some time at Mount Macedon at the Australian Institute of, or I think it's the Australian Emergency Management Institute. Um, you spent time there uh, playing a key role in emergency management. Then you went to um, Bangkok uh, to work at the Asian Disaster Preparedness Centre. And since 2013, you've been in Geneva working with the World Health Organization and you've been working, uh, one of your strengths has been working on health emergency disaster risk reduction management. Have I got it wrong? I've got it right? No. <laughs> well, both of them are satisfactory. <laughs> well, um, so those, 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 that's sort of been a bit of your pathway. So um, that might be of interest to people who are sort of trying to plan their own pathways, although they can't start at Amy anymore because it's no longer there, thanks to our um, one of our previous prime ministers. Um, why you want to get rid of a, an emergency, the only emergency management college in Australia, I do not know. But anyway, that's what happened. So. Um, we're very lucky to have uh, Jonathan with us because he has, he's actually in Australia at the moment, so he's not looking blurry-eyed because it's in the middle of the night. So if you'd like to take over, Jonathan, I'll stop sharing my screen and you can share yours. And if you'd like to say a little bit more about yourself, that would be lovely. Um, there you go. I've stopped sharing mine. So can you see my screen now? I can see your screen and you, and I hope everybody else okay, can. Okay, that's, that's all very well. Um, well, I can share a little bit more about my career in the sense that I, I, when I left school, I went and worked in the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, worked there in human resources, which I think has been very valuable in the work that I've done subsequently. Um, and then through that period of working in Human Resources. I studied at University of Melbourne um, and then uh, returned to the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs on a regular basis and eventually went into the health program. I did my master's at Emory University and when I came back in 1994, I helped establish the National Centre for War-Related Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder and spent quite a bit of time in Melbourne at the Heidelberg Repat. Uh, and then I went into Emergency Management Australia, and that meant that I spent quite a bit of time at Mount Macedon and worked with a lot of colleagues on the development of risk management, and particularly at the nexus between public health and emergency management. Uh, from there, I went into AusAid, uh, which was also very helpful, and then... From about 2004, I, I went into WHO, uh, first of all, working on deliberate use of biological, chemical and radiological agents. I spent a year and a half in Geneva and from there went to spend three years at the Asian Disaster Preparedness Centre, uh, ultimately taking the position of Director of Public Health and Emergencies. And then from 2008, actually, I went back to WHO in Geneva to work on disaster risk reduction, emergency preparedness, and as I will share in this uh, presentation, on the development of health emergency and disaster risk management. So um, actually for the last 13 years or so in, in Geneva. And so uh, I had the privilege of being uh, invited to give the Skip Burkle lecture at the Madri Summer Forum in February this year, and Madri had every good intention uh, to uh, record the presentation, record the lecture, uh, but due to technical difficulties, it, it didn't happen. So uh, with uh, Frank and 
Caroline's agreement, I'm going to give a rerun of that particular particular lecture and also uh, hope that this will get recorded uh, this time. So please uh, bear with me. Uh, whilst I'm uh, 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 working at WHO uh, in, for this particular lecture, I'm giving it in my personal capacity, but I'd still like to credit WHO for what I'm, a lot of, of what I'm about to share with you today. Uh, it's, been, it's my honour to uh, follow in the footsteps of many of the Skip Burkle lecturers who have uh, gone before me. Uh, Skip has uh, been an inspiration to me and to many people working in disaster health and humanitarian action. I've always felt his enthusiastic support and encouragement to carry forward the torch that he's lit, uh, inspired by his humanity, his humility. He's a truly amazing man, and uh, my best wishes to Skip and his family. Uh, Skip is not alone, though. Uh, Monash University Disaster Resilience Initiative has been a real champion of health emergency and disaster risk management, and I've appreciated their support uh, throughout uh, this journey. It's been very enthusiastic and much appreciated. Um, Madri plays a very vital national and regional role in higher education, uh, higher learning, professional development and research. And it's, it really is uh, doing a lot to bring people together, uh, build alliances and really take forward uh, the, the concept and practice and research around health emergency and disastrous management. It is a challenge both nationally and uh, globally to have more entities like Madri. Um, we really do need institutions and fortunately uh, Melbourne, Victoria, Australia and the Oceania region has uh, Madri uh, and I'd like to uh, express my thanks to, uh, to Frank, to Caroline, to Jude, Stuart, Samantha, Dudley, and all the team for your continued uh, dedication and commitment to keep this uh, uh, vital asset alive. I really uh, would like to pay respect to uh, Indigenous peoples all over the world, uh, to uh, my ancestors, my family, all the people in, in health, in emergency management, uh, in, in all walks of life who have brought the field of um, health emergency and disaster risk management to where it is today. And we really do stand on your shoulders and uh, aspire to greater heights in order to uh, ensure our communities are safer uh, and healthier and of course, uh, in, in increasing their, their well-being. Um, we come together in an extremely challenging time uh, where uh, the world, including uh, Melbourne, has been uh, faced by the COVID-19 pandemic uh, day in, day out for many months. And uh, the future remains uh, uncertain. I think it's also important to say that the International Standards Organization couldn't have put it any better when they uh, defined risk as the effect of uncertainty on objectives. Really, our business is, is essentially all about managing uncertainty, whether it be the evolution of the pandemic, uh, planning for the recovery, or ensuring that after uh, the pandemic, we have much safer uh, and uh, healthier communities. But uh, COVID-19 is not the only risk that communities face. There's climate change and many other types of, of risks. So when we consider it, how are we going to manage all of these risks um, concurrently? And I hope in this presentation, um, I'll give some indication as to how uh, the risk management and whole of society approach can help um, address these concerns. Uh, the title of my presentation is 
uh, the uh, working together for health, safety, and well-being of communities, evolution, and future directions for health emergency and disaster risk management. And it's a complex topic to say the least, um, but it's really understanding all of that complexity, the complex uh, nature of risks, uh, risk management measures, uh, the mutual dependence of, the, of all the actors, um, all of that really uh, needs to come together if we are to ensure that our communities uh, are going to be safer and, and more resilient. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, to uh, paraphrase uh, Russell and Einstein from 1955, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we use to create them. And we have to learn to think in a new way. And reflecting on COVID-19, perhaps this is the biggest challenge that the world faces. So I would like to um, frame this particular presentation in terms of the, the why, the how, and the what of health emergency and disaster risk management. I do feel though we, do, we need to focus much more on the positives. So rather than start with the challenges, let's talk about the catalysts and progress and some of the key success factors um, that we see today. One of those is that there's considerable global attention uh, on all types of emergencies, COVID-19, climate change, and so forth. And all this provides a catalyst for uh, po policies and action on emergencies. There's a much greater focus at global and national level on people and community-centered action, whether it be in terms of localization or um, leave no one behind, accountability to affected populations and so forth. The communities and countries also calling for much greater action on the environment, ecosystems and climate change. And we get some good indications from those who have been uh, pro promoting the management of, of air pollution to give us some pointers on how other risks can be managed, as well as One Health at that climate, uh, sorry, at that uh, ecosystem human health and animal health interface. And then we also see a much more focus on um, anticipatory action, uh, particularly in the, in, the in the agricultural sector, forecast-based financing and so forth. We also have seen tremendous progress in aspects of health emergency and disaster risk management, such as the development of the emergency medical teams, and also the application of emergency management practice, such as emergency operation centers, incident management systems, and, and so on, as well as annual, uh, exercise simulations, um, annual reviews, uh, um, after action reviews. And then um, we can see that in different parts of, of public health, it's moving forward very uh, rapidly, such as in mental health and psychosocial support. We've also seen a lot of emergent capacities in, uh, in uh, Ebola and COVID-19 whether it be in terms of the vaccines, therapeutics and diagnostics or in the uh, new coordination mechanisms that have been established. We've seen how the role of health workers and has, uh, has, has got much greater value than it's had before, as well as the, the leadership uh, of organisations, including WHO, which more or less have been united in providing uh, science-based advice on, to communities and government in relation to uh, the management of, of COVID-19. If we look at some of the key success factors uh, for effective health emergency and disaster risk management, uh, this is based on, on research, but also some of my observations and experience working with countries. We see long-term programs uh, with, with champions who have been working in those roles for, for, many, for many years. Uh, we also see effective coordination mechanisms uh, with dedicated uh, full-time staff with regular budgets uh, working at all levels. We see that the health leaders in emergency management are really well respected and integrated into uh, the disaster management and other multi-sectoral mechanisms. We see how the, those um, 
countries have really invested in workforce, whether it be in education or training or exercises, which is bringing all people together. And uh, also quite critically, they've taken advantage of the windows of opportunity that exist during and after emergencies uh, when there are resources available and when attention is on emergencies to really build capacity um, for the future and reduce risks of future disasters. We also see that in the, at the global policy level, uh, there's much greater focus on uh, managing the risks of emergencies. Um, the Sustainable Development Goals uh, includes one goal, uh, target in the health goal, which is about strengthening capacities for early warning risk reduction and the management of national and global health risks. The Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction has, gone, has, has now something like 38 references to public health. It's central to uh, the outcomes and the goal, and it's extremely relevant to all of the um, seven targets. Um, this is a, a major step forward on the three references to public health in the Kyogo framework. And then if we look at the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, um, the WHO 13th General Program of Work, it's got three billions, at its, uh, uh, three billions as its pillars, and one of those is one billion people better protected from emergencies. And then we see there's lots of reviews um, and reports in WHO and at global and regional levels, uh, analyzing what's happening uh, around emergencies, in particular COVID-19, and they're all trying to make recommendations as to how systems and capacities can be improved in the future. And we also have, as I'll talk about later, the health emergency and disaster risk management framework. So these are some of the successes, but as we know, there are enormous challenges. And here are some of the statistics. Um, when I gave the presentation on the 14th of February, uh, there were uh, 182 million cases of COVID-19 and 2.38 million deaths. Uh, those figures have essentially doubled in the last uh, seven, seven months or so, uh, tragically. So we're now up to 222.1 million cases and 4.57 uh, million deaths. But that's only about COVID and we have humanitarian system, assistance, 235 million people in need of humanitarian assistance and that's growing. We also have data, but the data around the impacts of hazards on communities uh, tends to be the large scale events. Uh, these are just referring to uh, the average annual number of events, deaths and people affected for natural hazard events between 2010 and 2019, lots of people. Um, and then WHO has also uh, analyzes uh, up to 200 major outbreaks a year and the economic losses are uh, significant. But what I also wanted to say is that these are really underestimates of impacts. There are a lot of hazards that are not well covered, for example, heat, and also there is all the medium and long-term uh, impacts of, of these events on, on communities, on um, people's health, such as in disability or non-communicable diseases, um, uh, et cetera. I'll also point out that for every uh, major event, there are probably uh, around 200 small to medium events. And it's really important that we link uh, the the action on small events to the large scale events. We, we do have to prepare for large scale events, but by investing in uh, the prevention, preparedness, response and recovery for the smaller scale events, they will put us in uh, good stead for the management of the large scale events. And also in order for those capacities to be sustained for the large scale events, then they need to be used on a regular basis. And that's where these um, more frequent uh, small-scale events um, come into play. I'd also like to commend to you the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board reports. Uh, in 2019, uh, they made the, these observations, which unfortunately have come to fruition, that the world is really not prepared 
for a pandemic, uh, that the poor will suffer the most, our economy is extremely vulnerable, um, and uh, there's been this erosion of trust in institutions. And uh, that's been uh, clearly evident in a, a number of countries. And I think actually it's, it's interesting to, it will be interesting to analyze how that trust uh, play, has played out across different countries and indeed different states of, of countries, including Australia. Uh, we also have seen that in COVID uh, times, which is uh, also evident in the, in the board's report from 2020, uh, where they made some initial observations that political leadership is, is incredibly important. The preparedness is not just about what the government does, it's also what people do to protect themselves. And the measures that were uh, in place to assess levels of preparedness for major outbreaks uh, were not predictive of the impacts of uh, COVID-19 on countries around the world. There's some further observations of challenges that countries and communities face. Well, we have, we've often seen that the work on health systems and emergencies have not been connected. Um, they're often in, in parallel. And we also see that uh, uh, the, the systems developed or the programs for epidemics have been in parallel to those for other types of hazards. There's been a much greater focus. There's been a traditional focus on the top-down approaches, really focusing on the central level. And there needs to be much more attention at the subnational and local levels where, where the risk is and where most of the risk management action takes place. Sadly, uh, many of the lessons from reviews, exercises, um, inquiries, commissions have not been applied. And, and there also tends to be a conversation, at least in public health, which, which focuses on the biomedical and technical issues, when we see, obviously, that governance, leadership, um, and all the social dimensions, including uh, managing the infodemic is, um, is particularly, or are particularly important too. So it's, it's all very complex, as there's no doubt about it. So uh, what sort of transformation do we wanna see given what I've just shared with you uh, then? Um, well, it, you may be familiar with this uh, table because a number of the uh, a lot of the risk management work was done in Australia and New Zealand coming out of the Australia risk and New Zealand risk management standard in, in 1995 and 2004. But essentially it's, it's moving from the left-hand side uh, to the right-hand side, from an event-based approach to a risk-based approach. We're really looking at um, the root causes of risk and how we manage vulnerabilities and uh, exposures, as well as hazards uh, and, the, and the response to all of those types of events. That we need to be far more proactive. We need to look at the all hazards approach to ensure that um, the capacities are developed for all of the risks that a community may face and not just the, the hazard of the day. Uh, we need a whole of society and multi-sectoral approach, obviously with many different disciplines. It's not just those people who have emergency in their titles, but it's essentially a shared responsibility of everybody working in health systems and, and all sectors. And it's about planning with communities, uh, and not for communities, um, so that uh, communities are essentially in the driving seat uh, uh, to be able to uh, design and deliver uh, the, the risk management measures that they need uh, in order to manage the risks that they face. So at this particular point in time, it would make sense to move into well, the what of um, health emergency and disaster risk management. But I just wanted to take a detour uh, and to discuss a little bit about the how. And we can talk about all the policies and strategies, the tools, the guidance, uh, the processes, the activities, the services, the evaluations and so forth. But essentially, as I've said before, um, the whole approach to emergency and disaster risk management is systems-based. We need to make sure that our um, 
our approaches and our solutions are commensurate with the size of the and the complexity of the problem. And in, in, in effect, the most critical thing is going to be uh, to effective systems is the building the relationships of the different actors. Um, it takes time, uh, but really everybody needs to invest in, in building those relationships. And it's also one of the reasons why staff turnover in emergency and disaster risk management is, is so detrimental because it breaks down those relationships that take so time, so much time to develop. Well, three tenets that I would like to focus on. One is respect, the other is um, the other is confidence, and the third one is trust. So in terms of respect, um, respect for those people who uh, whose uh, lives are at risk of emergencies and disasters and their right to participate in the design and delivery of the uh, measures uh, that, uh, that they need to, to manage their risk. It's also respect for the, all of those who contribute to risk management, all of those actors, whether it be the uh, water engineer developing safe infrastructure or the community health worker who is de delivering uh, vaccination programs, they've all got vital roles to play. They're all welcome and the systems need to ensure that they are enabled to make their contribution effectively. Secondly, secondly trust. Trust is essentially um, having trust in, in that people will do, or at least try to do, what the right thing. Uh, and so we need to make sure that we, we build trust in all of our emergency uh, management activities right throughout um, people coming together working together um, so that uh, that trust can be um, strengthened and then the third element um, that I referred to is confidence and that is that people have the ability to do the right thing so when we looking at that we that's why we need to make sure that uh, when we do our assessments we do the training the exercises the planning and, and all, as well as operations, that we do it in a, in a joined up way so that we can continue to, to build those um, relationships based on respect, trust and confidence. So I think also it'd be useful to just chart the evolution of health emergency and disaster risk management. It's been quite a long journey, um, but if we start in the 70s, there was a lot of focus on preparedness and response. And then we moved into the 70s when um, prevention and recovery was, a, was associated with preparedness and response because there needed to be much more emphasis on being proactive in prevention and also uh, ensuring that recovery also um, not only uh, deals with the aftermath of the emergency, but also reduces the risk of future uh, disasters. In the 80s and 90s, um, there was understanding basically that um, emergencies and disasters were affecting people differentially. Um, so it looked more into the sources of vulnerability and the social determinants. And it was then that disaster risk reduction came to the fore. Then in the 2000s, as I mentioned before, the, the risk management standard was, was very helpful in Australia. Uh, but the whole concept of risk management um, evolved and as well as global health security uh, was essentially a response to um, the anthrax attacks of, of 2000 and, um, 2001. Um, and then uh, we also seen in the 2010s uh, a much greater focus on resilience and the evolution of the 2030 sustainable development agenda. And oftentimes these developments occurred in response to uh, significant events such as the anthrax attacks, such as the SARS, such as Ebola, which gave rise to the WHO health emergencies program. And it remains to be seen what will come out of um, COVID-19. Whilst we were developing the health emergency and disaster risk management framework, we have been using the risk management approach whole of uh, society approach in the development of various um, 
resolutions at the World Health Assembly or in, with respect to different guidance. This is an example on uh, sexual and reproductive health. Um, it's also been used in the guidance note on disability and emergency risk management. And also there was a document on pandemic influenza risk management. We also developed um, fact sheets for around 13, 14 um, domains for public health. And uh, why is this um, important? What are the risk management measures before, during and after emergencies? And also some further reading. So I, I commend those to you. But there were many other documents that were used. And we also obviously used this, uh, uh, the rationale for health emergency and disaster risk management to uh, in the negotiations of the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. With all of this, uh, there were, or uh, whilst this was all happening, there were many other um, uh, frameworks that were being developed, but essentially we didn't have a framework that that was overarching, that provided a bridge uh, between the multi-sectoral frameworks and the health policies and frameworks. And so this is really where the health emergency and disaster risk management framework um, uh, fits in. It, it, what it's trying to do is um, align health emergency and disaster risk management with the uh, sustainable development, the climate change, epidemic preparedness and response agendas. Uh, it uh, integrates and, and draws upon um, the good practice of emergency and disaster risk management, um, climate change, humanitarian action, uh, health system strengthening, so forth. It um, provides a bridge between health and the multi-sectoral frameworks. Uh, what we try to do is provide a, a common language for everybody to use, so it's not heavy on, on jargon. Uh, and it's also a, a framework that addresses uh, all types of risk management measures for all types of emergencies and disasters, not just infectious diseases or natural hazards, et cetera. So this is the vision of health EDRM. It's essentially an application of the, the vision of public health, which is the highest possible standard of health and well-being. But in this particular context, it's people at risk of emergencies in order to achieve greater resilience, health security, universal health coverage, and sustainable development. And what we want to see out of these processes of applying health emergency and disaster risk management is that there are, the countries and communities really have stronger capacities and systems to reduce risks and consequences of all types of emergencies and disasters. The guiding principles more or less reflect that transformation table that I shared with you. Um, whether it be the um, risk-based approach or multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary collaboration, it really does need to be inclusive, uh, whole of health system based, and people working on health emergency and disaster risk management uh, need to apply ethical principles in the work that they do with communities, but also with one, one another, as well as upholding um, human rights, including the right to health or access to um, health services. What we've done is take uh, the frameworks such as Sendai, the health system building blocks, the international health regulations, and translate that into this common framework that draws on all of those other frameworks. And you'll notice that the language of the health EDRM framework and these 10 components is not full of jargon. It sh should be something that everybody can understand. Um, it doesn't refer specifically to preparedness or to response um, or to language of emergency management. This is, enables the inclusiveness of the health emergency and disaster risk management framework. And behind each of those 10 components, there are some 200 functions. So this is the example of community EDRM component, and you'll see the, the 12 or so functions there, which, which all are all important. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter whether we're talking about uh, maternal and child health, or occupational health and safety, or planning, 
or recovery. Um, all of those elements are important in order for communities to be healthier, safer, safer and more resilient. And the key is really to ensure that the people who are responsible for those functions are involved in the process. Uh, so that once again emphasizes the need for a much bigger group of people, a much bigger group of stakeholders who are involved right through uh, the health emergency and disaster risk management system. We've also been able to apply the risk management framework in other documents, such as the accompanying glossary, the WHO guidance on research methods for health EDRM, uh, and uh, allied to that is the uh, community of practice on WHO for the thematic platform for health EDRM research network. Uh, that's all about providing much better uh, guidance to improve um, uh, the, the practice of health EDRM research um, and also to build capacity uh, for conducting that research. Um, some of the other documents that uh, have, have used the health EDRM framework are listed there including one on whole of society action to manage uh, health risks and reduce socio-economic <clears throat> impacts of emergencies and disasters, and our guidance notes on improving Sendai framework reporting. Um, you should also watch this space for the UN system guidance on helping build resilient societies. So I'm coming to the end of my um, presentation. Uh, I've tried to convey uh, some of the, uh, the, the why, the how, and the what of health emergency and disaster risk management. Given the complexity of managing risk, so I know that I've just really um, scratched the surface, but there are 7.8 million people, a billion people in the world and they've all got their own realities of the risks that they face, uh, which they are trying to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. W when we're in WHO producing global policy and guidance, it really needs to speak to all of those realities so that um, people can actually see themselves in that guidance, in that policy and then be able to um, use, apply, adapt that guidance um, to their local context. Uh, we do strive to, uh, to be, uh, strive for simplicity, and we also strive for a, a common narrative. So perhaps uh, these, these words of Lao Tzu um, encapsulate a lot of what I wanted to say, that simplicity, patience, and compassion are really our greatest treasures. So we are facing very challenging times um, with COVID-19 and all the other types of emergencies uh, uh, that uh, communities and countries are facing. Communities really need to be assured that good practice is being followed, good evidence-based practice is being followed. Um, we need to continue to um, apply health emergency and disaster risk management principles. We need to continue to um, build the communities of practice, build that evidence base for emergency and disaster risk management, and make sure that the lessons are not only identified, but they are learned in order to make communities uh, safer, more resilient, and healthier. And in I'd like to reiterate that the risk management approach, the health emergency and disaster risk management framework, and people really working together are crucial uh, for, uh, to reduce the health risks and impacts of all types of emergencies uh, today and in the future. And with that, I'd like to conclude my presentation and I'd be most welcome to uh, uh, I'd be, uh, welcome any um, conversations.
that we could have about what I've presented on health emergency and disaster risk management. And thanks again for the, the opportunity to present to you.